This is the lecture for Monday, uh, the 15th of March, 2021, for European history. We have just taken quizzes and corrected them, and we are dealing with the topic of trench warfare. So, some basic things. Trench warfare develops after the initial phase of motion uh, and mobility in the war where um, the Schlieffen plan is attempted and fails and where the uh, Battle of the Marne, the first Battle of the Marne, uh, fails uh, from a German point of view and something new needs to happen. So both sides race to the sea and ultimately their race ends up with a solid front between the Swiss border and the uh, coast of Flanders on the uh, North Sea coast. That's a long frontier. Now, here's an interesting difference between World War I and World War II. In World War I, what develops are solid trench lines uh, all the way from Switzerland to the sea. And these trench lines are filled with troops on both sides. In World War II, the armies never amass or don't amass that kind of manpower in so concentrated and static a fashion. In World War II, the standard entrenchment is not the trench line. It is the foxhole, which is an individual or maybe uh, for two or three people hole that you dig, and you basically live in that hole. It is your, your, your sleeping quarters, your latrine, your kitchen. You do everything there in that hole while you are stationed there. Now, what is the point of getting underground in the first place? Well, the easiest thing in the world to do on a battlefield is get shot. And the men have no armor. Kevlar is not really developed until the late 1970s. Even the steel helmets that are worn after the first third of the war by both sides uh, won't stop a bullet. They'll stop shell fragments. That's why the British Brody helmet has this sort of wide rim around it. Uh, and it's, it doesn't really go down much over the skull. It's because it's not designed to protect the person so much from the side. It's, de it's designed to protect the person who is hunkering down in the trenches from sh uh, shrapnel. Shrapnel is exploded bits of metal from artillery shells, grenades, things like that, that come from above. The British Brody helmet is built, is based upon uh, the uh, medieval uh, helmet worn by British soldiers uh, who are facing longbowmen, or who are longbowmen. Again, for the same reason. You've got this hat that doesn't come very far down on the head. It's got a nice wide brim, and you tilt it in whatever direction you expect the problems to come from. There simply aren't enough soldiers in World War II to justify trench lines, and they don't really get uh, to a static point where they can just concentrate men and men and men and men and men anywhere, anyway, in, uh, throughout most of World War II, urban warfare being an exception. So what is the structure of the trench lines? Well. In our game, you saw a little bit of it, and in the movie, hopefully, you saw a little bit of it. But it's not simply one line of trenches. And there is a fundamental difference between the British and French trenches on the one hand and the German trenches on the other. The British and French trenches, for political reasons, because a lot of French and Belgian territory is held by the Bosch, uh, that's the Germans. Their trenches are not seen as defensive. They are seen as a temporary measure from which to launch attacks. 
So for the most part, especially early on in the war, the French and British trenches are more haphazard, more improvised, less deep, less extensive. Over time, they will adapt. But at first, they cannot admit to themselves politically that this is where the current border is. They have to keep saying, uh, we are going to fight and get our territory back as soon as possible. The Germans, on the other hand, dig deeper and have more expense, extensive uh, labyrinths of trenches. But the basic structure of trenches follows a crenellation model. There are exceptions, but basically it looks like uh, the top of an old medieval castle. It goes up and down. Now, why? Why not just have straight trenches? Can anyone tell me? Yeah. What weapons are they using, Daisy? Yeah, they're using rifles. And what do you need for a rifle to hit the target? What do you need to have? Yeah. Eyes and distance? Yeah, you need to have the ability to see a target at distance. If you have long, straight trenches, what are you giving the enemy? Yeah? A precise and calculated uh, yeah. distance. You're actually making it easier for them. All I have to do is get into your trenches, and then they start shooting sideways, and everyone in the trench becomes a target. You're actually making it easier for them to hit. So by having the trenches go in an undulating fashion, you never have a long line of sight. Within the trench, you have a certain distance, maybe 50 feet, and then the trench turns. But that's only the front trench. Then you've got a series of what are called communications trenches. And the communications trenches run from the forward to the back. And the idea is you're using them to get to and come from the front line trenches. Then you've got a second line of trenches. And it may be one line, or it may be two line, or it may be some crazy quilt that looks like a chain. It depends on where and when. Trenches, for reasons that also should be obvious, are not identical. Because if they were, the enemy would have a real advantage in working his way through your trench system. So all trenches have unique features. Um, so you've got your second line of trenches, basically. And then you've got more communications trenches. And then with the Germans, you have a third line of trenches. The British and French eventually developed theirs too, but for the most part, they, they stick with two, two and a half lines of trenches. The Germans have three or more in most cases. Now, there's another feature of the trenches that has to do with where people sleep, called a dugout. When I think of a dugout, I think of baseball. And you've got one side and the other side, and they're sort of in this half-submerged uh, dugout where the team sits when it's not playing, where the manager stands, and stuff like that. Uh, over here by the flag is a picture of my favorite Yankee manager, Billy Martin, standing in the trench uh, in the dugout in the 1970s looking out at the game. In American Indian terms, uh, a dugout is a canoe made of a single piece of log that has most of the log dug away so that the uh, log is now an actual canoe that you can sit in. But in World War I terminology, a dugout is a subterranean chamber. When you saw Paul and the others hunkering down during the artillery shells, where the young soldier panicked and the other guys beat him up to prevent him from running out and getting killed, that was a dugout. A dugout is where you have your bunks, it's where you have your food uh, in the front lines. It's where you get out of the weather. Uh, it also, because of the way gravity works, in the rain is going to flood. So you need to have drainage out of your dugouts, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. But your dugout is your shelter. Sometimes you're in a dugout. Sometimes you're basically digging uh, sort of a bunk into the side of your trench. Um, Sometimes you're basically out in the open, maybe with some canvas over you. Behind the trenches are your artillery. So it is rare, but not unheard of, for artillery to get hit by enemy attacks directly. For the most part, the artillery smashes into each other's lines uh, with their long-distance weaponry. They get hit by artillery from the other side. The thing about artillery is you can't stop it. 
not with that level of technology, not even now. If you're in a position and the enemy wants to launch guns at you, big shells with explosive tips, you're going to get hit. You can stop a missile with an anti-missile missile, Patriot system and so forth, Iron Dome, but you cannot stop a bullet. At least we don't have a method for doing that even now in 2021. So artillery is the most important part of an army in World War I because it can basically prepare the battlefield by turning it into a cratered moonscape, destroying anything, damaging enemy trenches, maybe collapsing dugouts. And that's the thing. Dugouts are supposed to be bomb proof, but if they get hit by a direct hit, they're collapsing. So you could be sleeping and then all of a sudden you're under tons of earth because earth is heavy. Uh, and maybe you dig yourself out and maybe you don't. In front of the trench lines are the barbed wire. And that barbed wire is designed as a last ditch protection against uh, enemy infantry attacks. The barbed wire is not just in one line. There are usually several lines of it. And you also augment that with mine. Just go ahead and rip it. It's not a problem. Uh, you, you augment that with minefields. So you plant mines in various places and the enemy charges and blow up. Um, so you, what you have is a, an in-depth set of fortifications. Not castle walls, not even old-style fortresses with stone walls, because modern explosives can, for the most part, turn them to smithereens. You've got earthenworks. For four years, four and a third years, you've got earthenworks. You're digging in. What kind of weather is in northwest Europe, northeastern France? Well, they've got rain, they've got snow, they've got ice, they've got sun, they've got all the kinds of weather that we have, except it's moisture, much moisture. So, um, where do you think all that water collects? It collects in the very same dugouts and trenches where the people are living. What about the bodies, the partially exploded bodies of the dead killed by artillery, or the bodies of people in no man's land, the area between the trench lines? Well, they stay there for the most part. There are some exceptions. Clearly, you're going to clean up the bodies on your side of the trenches, enemies as well as your own, because if you leave bodies around, you're inviting disease. It's also freaking disgusting, and it smells. But you only have so much control over the area, even in your own trenches, because the enemy grenades, artillery, snipers. A sniper is a long-distance marksman that has uh, usually some kind of telescopic sight, and they are good at hitting targets at distance, which is not an easy thing to do. You either need to have really good math skills or really good instincts to calculate the effects of distance, wind, and everything else on a bullet so that you can hit a target. Uh, we have snipers today that use heavy uh, 50 caliber bullets that can hit targets a mile or more away on their first try, which is amazing. But they have computer-assisted targeting and, and, and a bunch of other advantages from over a century of modern warfare. The whole point of the trench line is to absorb the force of the blow. Now, the enemy is going to use human wave attacks. That's how both sides start out. A human wave attack is almost like the Romans. You have lines of troops, and they have fixed bayonets. And like in the Napoleonic Wars and the Seven Years' War, they're going to march up, and the enemy's going to fire and wither and fire and wither, and then you get close enough, and you charge with bayonets, and you kill them with the bayonet. Um, or you have your men get closer, and you have them volley fire when they're close. This is Napoleonic tactics, pre-Napoleonic tactics, tactics of the early firearms age. However, the early firearms age did not take into account modern rifle fire, let alone machine gun fire, mortar fire, 
flamethrower attacks, artillery, um, or grenades. These things make approaching your enemy at a walk with bayonets suicide. But it isn't until early uh, mid-1916 that both sides finally give up the human wave attack for something more dispersed. It's still, in effect, a human wave attack in that you're sending a mass of humanity at the enemy. But after 1916, these attacks don't happen at the walk in a straight line with fixed bayonets. You're sneaking your way across the battlefield a lot like you guys did during the game. On the first morning of the Battle of the Somme, over 60,000 British soldiers were killed because they did human wave attacks all morning. One after the other after the other. The whistles blow, the men climbed out of the trenches, formed light ranks, they had already had fixed bayonets, and they're marching towards the enemy. And the Germans cut them down like wheat. Now, over 60,000 men in one morning. That's more men, significantly more men, than we lost in the entire Korean War, than we lost in the entire Vietnam War. Both of those were in the low 50,000s. And as to the War on Terror, we've lost fewer than 10,000 people in 20 years of war. That's an amazingly low figure. Um, 60,000 men in one morning. Hundreds of thousands of men in a few weeks at the Battle of the Somme as the British try to push the enemy back. The British took two years to get a massive army. They get it. J.R.R. Tolkien is in the attack, the writer of The Lord of the Rings, along with many others. He is wounded at the Battle of the Somme, and his wounds pull him out of the war, and of his entire group of friends, all of them die except him in that war. And the death of his friends and the fact that he's the lone survivor, that makes an impression on him. You want to know why a man like him is driven to become a, an Oxford professor of philology, which is languages, who raises a family with many children and still finds time to do extensive writings on the, uh, the sagas of Iceland and uh, Beowulf and, in addition, write fiction like The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and The Silmarillion? He is the lone survivor. They all had big dreams. He's the only one that can fulfill those dreams. So he lives and he carries the responsibility and his life is dedicated not just to himself, not just to his family, but to those who died. Death is always with him. And if you, if you look at his work, there's one scene from The Lord of the Rings where Frodo and Sam and Gollum are going through the Dead Marshes, a place near Mordor where a great battle was fought, where the dead of the great battler left. And there is flame from over some of these pools of water. How can you have flame come out of water? Well, it's escaping swamp gas. It's methane. It's from the dead bodies. And there's a moment where Frodo is drawn into the water by a face and falls in and there he is with the dead and the dead move that probably happened to Tolkien in one of those shell craters people ask me what's that green stuff in the bottom of the craters well what it is is a mixture of water rainwater mud and dead bodies some of which are more intact than others The sound of the guns was deafening. I'm not talking the rifles or even the machine guns. The sound of the artillery could be heard for miles away. Now, on the ground, there were attempts to, after 1916, solve the problem. By the way, 1916 is a big turning point year. The war starts in 1914. In 1915, both sides are firming up, they're, they're bringing their reserves in, they're getting ready for a big push in 1916. But 1915 is largely, largely marking time. There are a few attacks, but they're not of the super large kind. That's going to wait until 1916. The Allies have attacks planned. The British are going to start. 
in the Somme River Valley, they are going to push the Germans back. The goal is to push the Germans back, break their trench lines, and then send the cavalry through, and we'll have a war of motion like we used to. That's the goal. Meanwhile, the new German general, uh, chief general, chief of the general staff, General von Falkenhayn, he decides on a truly insidious plan to bleed the French army white. If you've ever seen a person bleed a lot, whatever skin color they have, whatever ethnic group they're a part of, if enough blood flows out of a particular region of a human body, it becomes a pasty white. The flesh becomes a pasty white because it doesn't have the blood in it that's uh, normally there. So when you use the expression bleed someone white, you're referring to something pretty nasty. What Falkenhayn plans is an attack at Verdun. But the Germans are not attacking to win. Verdun is an old pre, it's an old um, 18th century gunpowder fortress. So it's made of stone, but it's got trenches rather than tall walls. And it's also very important to French morale. It's got a lot of history. Falkenhayn calculates that the French won't give up Verdun without a fight. So his goal is to press the French with a German attack that doesn't kill that many Germans, but that draws the French into a kill zone prepared by the Germans. Because at Verdun, the French lines are curved. It's a, it's a salient. It's a bulge. And around that bulge are the Germans. So when the French come in to relieve Verdun, they're going to be hit from three sides by the Germans. Because of their political historical attachment to Verdun, the French won't let it go. So the Germans will continue to attack and continue to draw more Frenchmen in, and more Frenchmen will die. And this is a battle of attrition. What that means is it's a battle designed to draw the enemy in and kill large numbers of them. It's, it's not much strategy, more strategy than that. It's not very subtle at all, but it works. Verdun begins around the time of the Battle of the Somme. So these two battles are often seen as uh, two sides of the same coin. There's a British attack that's for real, but it's very badly planned in that uh, the, the British soldiers are wasted in these human wave attacks. And at the same time, the French army is getting drawn into this protracted battle over Verdun. It's at the Battle of Verdun that Marshal Pétain famously says, they shall not pass, which later is used by Tolkien. Esaran, uh, passeran, port. I don't know frogs speak. I don't know French. So if any of you know they shall not pass in French, tell me. I, it's something like passeran, port, or something. I, I vaguely remember. Does anyone know enough French to say they shall not pass in imperative tense? No. <laughs> No. Okay. Well, in any event, it's very uh, Gandalf-like. Okay. You shall not pass. Um, and Patan is a great hero at Verdun. In World War II, he's going to have a very different legacy. But at Verdun, he is he is a hero. Now, some of the French units are under a greater degree of suffering because some of the French units at Verdun are led by young officers who actually understand modern weapons. And so they're deployed in such a way as to not be immediately killed. They keep fighting and are slowly killed by the Germans. The whole point of the German attack is not to take territory. It's to draw the French into a killing zone and kill as many of them as they can. In the end, it's stalemate on both sides. The French hold Verdun, but you waste so many troops that in 1917, the next year, the French army mutinies uh, when they're, t they're, they're promised that they have a new style of attack by their new general, Nivelle. And Nivelle promises that they're going to attack in a smart way, and if the attack doesn't immediately work, they're going to stop attacking. Well, Nivelle has no new ideas. Uh, his attack fails, and he keeps sending men into the meat grinder. So the French army mutinies in 1917 from one end of the front to the other. The Germans don't exploit it because, well, 
They don't fully understand what's going on until it's too late. And by the time it's too late, the French army is uh, back in action because the mutineers are slaughtered en masse by the French authorities. So the attacks on the ground are at a stalemate. What to do? Well, there's air power. Wilbur and Orville, Orville Wright uh, developed the world's first airplane in the early 1900s at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And uh, at first, in World War I, you've got these gossamer thin, delicate, dragonfly like monoplanes and biplanes, which are used for scouting. Um, planes pass each other, guys salute one another as they pass, and they watch where the enemy soldiers are going, and they draw it on maps, and they come back, and they report. But as people start losing friends, uh, these planes, these pilots begin to, and their, and their observers begin to bring bricks, and they wing bricks at each other. And then they wing grenades at each other, and then they start shooting revolvers at one another, or rifles at one another. Eventually, the first fighter planes are developed with machine guns, but there's a problem. The thing about a machine gun is it disgorges a lot of lead downrange. How to aim it? See, pusher aircraft with their engines in back are not as efficient at this tech level as puller aircraft. So you have your propeller in the front, right in front of the pilot. The best place to put the machine guns is right in front of the pilot so that he can aim the plane and thus aim his attack. However, the, mach the, the bullets are going to hit your own propeller and you're going to shoot yourself down. It's sort of a problem. So they come up with little turrets with guys in the back, but that doesn't really work. Uh, and then they come up with, the allies come up with, hey, We'll put the machine gun on top of the top wing. So the pilot has to fly the plane, stand up, grab the machine gun, and <laughs> while he's maneuvering. The Germans come up with, and, and, and the Allies come up with another plan too. They armor their propellers, gambling that if you go, <laughs> your armor on your propellers is going to last longer than the propeller. or uh, and, and you basically can shoot through it. And hit, but the problem with that is you you will st still eventually shoot your own propeller off. But more to the point, the deflectors, the 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 metal sh shields over the over the propellers, ricochet the bullets right back at you. <laughs> so you're going ow, <laughs> which is a problem. A guy named Fokker, F O K K E R, Fokker, <laughs> develop what's called develops what's called the interrupters here. And the interrupter gear is a technical solution. It tracks when the propeller is going to be in front of the machine gun. And you're firing, but the interrupter gear will go and it'll stop while the propeller is in front of the machine gun. Once it's passed, you'll continue firing. It's a very German solution. It's very technical. Uh, so in 1916, the Fokker menace appears as these new planes have much better machine guns than the British and French. Eventually, the British and French capture enough uh, uh, Fokker aircraft that were down to figure out the interrupter gear and copy it. And by 1917 and 1918, there's fairly uh, there's air power parity in the sky. The truth is, though, even the heaviest bombers of World War I don't carry many bombs, and they're very easy to shoot, shoot down. The Germans also have in World War I what are called Zeppelins, which are giant rigid airships filled with hydrogen. <sighs> Do any of you know enough about chemistry to see the problem here with it's hydrogen? Like it's a giant, yeah. Yeah. giant ball flaming gas. Yeah, yeah. So both sides use observation balloons, which are soft balloons. And the first parachutes are in the hands of these balloon observers. You put a balloon up on your side, they have the ability to see the enemy. The enemy sends fighter planes with incendiary bullets, and as soon as the enemy fighter planes begin the attack, the, the, the guys in the balloons jump out of the balloons, hit their silt, and float down as the balloons become flaming masses because they have hydrogen gas too. Well, the Zeppelin has a rigid body, and it has engines on it, and it can move fast, and it can fly higher than many planes. 
But eventually the planes figure out how to get higher and higher, and uh, the Zeppelins become giant explosives. Air power is um, something that helps the armies see one another. There are massive fighter battles, there are bomber attacks, but it's not a mature technology yet. So air power is not going to be decisive in World War I. It's not going to change the battle on the ground. They try underground, digging tunnels with explosives. In 1917, at I think it's called Menzies Ridge in Belgium, the British plant so much explosives under this enemy trench line that when they blow it up, the hillside disappears and windows are blown out across the English Channel in London. That's how big the explosion is. It's one of the biggest pre-atomic explosions in human history. And you just what, you, what the British did is they just loaded and loaded and loaded explosives under these German lines and then just blew the, the hillside away. But that's not efficient. And the fact is the British themselves were so traumatized by it that they couldn't make very good on the attack. They advanced a little bit, but not far. Now, the British do have a technical solution. Uh, the technical solution is the land ironclad, which H.G. Wells wrote about. Imagine a warship with on land. And so um, the British develop what's called Little Willie, which is an American-style uh, tractor uh, with armor plate and guns. <laughs> Little Willie named after Kaiser Wilhelm, designed to insult him. And eventually, they build the world's first functional tanks. Uh, these Mark IV and Mark V tanks are giant, oblong, rhombus-shaped tanks. If you've ever seen the third Indiana Jones movie, get rid of the turret on the top, and it's, it's basically a Mark V tank. And they, work, they move at walking speed. And the idea is uh, it's a tank. Why is it called a tank? Uh, because the British didn't want to call it a land ironclad and tip off their hand. So they sold it in all of their um, paperwork as a mobile water tank for troops. Basically, you put a water tank on treads and you move it around and you have water as much as you can fill the tank up with. Um, but the name's Hank for whatever reason sticks. Now, at Cam Bryan, 1917, the British first try massed numbers of tanks. But even they don't appreciate how effective they're going to be. So the tanks at Cambrai, they break down after a while, but they break through the German lines. But the British aren't expecting to break through the German lines. Everything they've tried to break through the German lines has failed, so they didn't really account on the tanks doing the job. The tanks induce what's called tank terror, which is, uh, here you are in, in clothing, and you're in a trench, and you hear and the ground begins to shake, and you look up and you see this giant metal mass looming over you and then dropping down into the tank, and if you're in its way, you become human jelly. Uh, and it's got machine guns and small artillery pieces, and you shoot at it and nothing happens. The bullets bounce off. It's a giant behemoth, and you're incapable of stopping it. So uh, the tanks roll forward, and the Germans panic. They've never seen it. They've never expected anything like this. Um, by the time the British realize what's going on, most of their tanks have either broken down or run out of gas, and the Germans secure their lines behind them. The next time the British use tanks, the Germans are psychologically more prepared. Tanks are going to be effective in 1918. The French have these little Renault tanks, little tiny tanks, drive around with a little tiny turret and a guy inside going sweeps and you're like a, like a like a human Dalek. That's what they base the Dr. Who Daleks on. Um, and the British have these massive tanks. Now, the French and Germans each try to build tanks, and they stink on ice. They're too big, they're too heavy, they're not mobile enough, their engines are too weak. So French and German tanks exist, but they're not very useful. The British are useful. Uh, the French have big tanks, should I say. The French and uh, German big tanks are not useful. The French have little tanks, which are useful for scouting, and the British have big tanks, which are useful for breaking through. The Germans go a different route. They develop a new type of soldier called the Stormtrooper. And unlike the Imperial Stormtroopers of Star Wars, these guys can shoot. What the Germans do is they, uh, they cull all of their other units, units of their youngest, most aggressive, most healthy troops. And they give them new weapons, including the world's first submachine gun, a Burke gun designed by a guy named Bergman. 
And this gun basically shoots pistol bullets, but it's a portable machine gun. It's like this long. And uh, the stormtroopers are given new uniforms with big pockets to fill them with grenades. And the idea is these young, aggressive, full of piss and vinegar soldiers are going to lead the attack. The German artillery is going to start striking. And everyone expects the artillery is going to go for several days, maybe even a couple of weeks. No, no. The artillery begins with the stormtroopers right behind what's called a rolling barrage. So the British go underground for their rolling barrage, and the French do. And the stormtroopers are following the rolling barrage about 80 to 100 yards behind, which is really, really close. You need to have good artillerymen to pull this off, otherwise they'll hit your own guys. Anyway, the artillery barrage rolls forward, the stormtroopers follow. Before anyone realizes that the stormtroopers are in the British and French trenches, grenades, machine guns, uh, submachine guns, and suddenly the Germans are going to have an advantage. Now this is all done in the spring of 1918. And I've spoken about trench warfare in terms of technicalities, but I will say this one last thing. Throughout 1914, 15, and 16, into 1917, the Allies have been the British, the French, and the Russians. They've been joined by Romania and a few other countries. But in 1917, the Russian emperor is overthrown. He's abdic he abdicates. And uh, eventually the Republican Russian government, which wants to keep fighting the war, is also overthrown by the communists. So by the end of 1917, early 1918, the communists and the Germans make a treaty. Millions and millions of troops that the Germans have used to conquer massive swaths of Russia on the Eastern Front go west. And in the spring of 1918, the attack that has the stormtroopers also has, for the first and only time since the beginning of the war, a massive German advantage. So in the spring of 1918, what's called the St. Michael Offensive, named after the patron saint of Germany, is launched. And at the storm, with the rolling barrage of artillery and the stormtroopers behind, the Germans finally break through the Allied lines. And we're going to leave that there for today. We'll continue tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. You may talk quietly among yourselves. <laughs> You at home, make sure you do your quizzes and email them to me so that I can send you back the correction sheets. Bye-bye.